Okay, today's speaker is Subhashini Subramanian. She is yeah, visiting DTC from Purdue University. She is working with Dev Niyogi on her PhD thesis and will be defending soon, right? As soon as she gets all her committee members together, yeah. <laughs> and she is visiting as a DTC visitor and she is working with the h model to put a new uh, landmark in the idealized framework. And she will be talking on interaction of tropical cyclones with land. Okay, the floor is all yours. Thank you. And if anybody wants to ask any questions, just raise your hand. Good to use the microphone because there are remarks. Hello. Can everybody hear me? All right. Cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Subhashni. I'm from Purdue University. I've been doing my PhD for the last five years and hopefully should uh, be done by uh, October. So this is sort of my pre-PhD defense talk, sort of outlines my first few chapters. Um, it was great being here. Uh, this past six weeks have flown like crazy. Uh, it was so good. Really cool people. Uh, I really enjoyed working with all of you. Uh, you could just knock in, pop in, and say, hey, I have a problem, and you could get things done. It was pretty great, and I think I loved every minute of uh, being here. Um, so my talk today is going to be on um, impact of antecedent land state on post-landfall tropical cyclone sustenance. And uh, my work at DC uh, primarily was to implement um, land surface in um, the ideal HOF model that is already existing. Um, I would like to thank Gopal, who is who is a very close collaborator, and also my and also in my advisory committee, um, and Dev Niyogi, which uh, to to give me an opportunity to connect with so many people who are extremely good at what they're doing, and to provide me with an awesome network of people to work with. Um, uh, um, so my talk today is going to be uh, a short background on what I'm doing and how my question evolved. Uh, next would be about uh, uh, ideal h -wurf and how we configure the ideal h -wurf itself and uh, how we introduce land surface into uh, the ideal h -wurf. Um Results pertaining to how this model could be used, how this ideal model could be used as a tool to study land surface processes and the interaction of land surface processes on tropical cyclone. Um, then to validate the ideal model that we have uh, developed, uh, we're also uh, considering a real case study um, just to make sure that it all, it's all working perfect and it's okay. Um, and then a few uh, results from the study and what is the way forward with this. Um, so, why is the land surface important? My my lab, Dev Niyogi, uh, uh, our lab uh, specializes in land surface impacts and land surface modeling. Uh, Shing last week gave a talk on crop model and and putting in a crop model with inside H inside WERF. Um, so we like to do land surface stuff. Uh, and my topic specifically is related to how land surface uh, interacts with tropical cyclones. So why is land surface very important? First and foremost is that um, it's the only physical boundary of a model. Uh, it forms a lower boundary condition and uh, it is very important to uh, represent this particular boundary as precisely as possible, as realistically as possible to get a good result. Um, the second one is that both abiotic and biotic systems, uh, abiotic systems like buildings, uh, roads, uh, et cetera, interact with the atmosphere and with the boundary layer through um, albedo, emissivity, soil characteristics, and so on. Um, and the biotic systems like plants and um, vegetation and, and even human beings interact with weather and climate uh, through LAI, vegetation fraction and how much of carbon dioxide do we release and so on and so forth. 
So the land surface is so variable and so complex, and it is also changing all the time. So you have uh, land use, land uh, land cover change that is happening very often. You have forest that is being replaced with crop cover and cropland that is being replaced with um, urban, uh, which is increasingly becoming urban. So uh, there's always a change in dynamics as to what happens in and around uh, a particular region. Uh, so it's very important to understand the coupling um, that are uh, involved between the land surface and the surface layer and the surface layer and the boundary layer and the boundary layer and beyond. And so is the radiation and uh, the amount of radiation absorbed by the land surface is also going to be uh, severely impacted by the kind of land surface that you have. Um, and how is land surface uh, important in TC dynamics? Um, one thing that you notice when um, one thing when uh, when when you talk about TC making landfall, uh, people talk about TC decaying after it makes landfall um, because there is a, a drop in surface fluxes and there's increased surface friction. Uh, and the next one is uh, when they get close to mid latitudes, they they transition into a cold core system and mid. Um, Extra tropical storm, but there are some cyclones which um, n which not very often, but then uh, they do make landfall and interact with land surface and uh, reintensify or even sustain after landfall. Uh, so why is this important? Uh, a lot of studies in the past have identified that land surface interacts with convective systems, the terrain, the land use, the soil temperature, and the soil moisture interacts with uh, convective systems. And uh, and since la uh, tropical cyclones makes more damage, has more impact over land, it is also very important to study how land surface impacts tropical cyclone evolution. Um, so uh, a couple of cases that I've outlined here, uh, uh, which are model examples for um, tropical cyclone sustenance after landfall. Um, one of them is TC Abigail in 2000, um, 2001 in Australia, where after making landfall, it decayed and, uh, and it re-intensified twice over land. And this was right around here, this region here. Uh, and, this is, and this is the soil map for Australia. And the western half of the Australia is very dry. And it, is also, uh, uh, it also has uh, desert-like uh, soil characteristics, which is very sandy, highly diffusive. Uh, thermal conductivity increases if it is uh, wetted by rainfall. So, uh, uh, and, and this is something that we also noticed with um, uh, Erin, uh, which made landfall in Texas and moved northward to Oklahoma. And actually was designated as a tropical storm only over land. And it formed a distinct eye over uh, Oklahoma. And uh, there were studies that have already attributed this reintensification to soil moisture anomaly because Oklahoma in 2007 had, uh, uh, had a lot of rain in the summer, so the land state was already primed. Um, the deep soil moisture was already high. Uh, for increased soil moisture fluxes. But then when we took a look at what the soil uh, characteristics looked like, and this was the region where um, uh, where Erin uh, re-intensified, and that region is again sandy soil and fine uh, fine particles which, uh, which are highly diffusive in nature and which can rapidly transfer heat in, back into the atmosphere. Um, so uh, there was a hypothesis that we developed saying, OK, you know what? Maybe there's something else going on with the soil characteristics rather than just the soil moisture. Uh, so we wanted to explore that further. Um, and then we sort of came up with a small flow chart as to how tropical cyclones might interact with uh, the land surface. And, and these are just three factors, soil uh, soil moisture, soil temperature, and the surface roughness, the three important factors that we know of and how they interact. But then already this was a, a much complicated process, a much complex, bigger problem, because there was nonlinear interactions between all the three variables. And we needed to isolate 
all of the impact of each of these variables. Um, so one of uh, one way of understanding the interaction between all those lands of his variables uh, was to understand the dynamics, the physical processes itself. And the best way of doing that is using an ideal ideal model, um, uh, so that you you eliminate. Uh, a lot of other interactions and a lot of other effects that generally confound when you study a real case. Um, so there was an ideal model that was already available. Um, it, but then the, uh, it, it had a synthetic vortex that was put into this, uh, put in a domain, and it was allowed to develop, and it was, and it gave you beautiful results for, but only for cyclones over the ocean. Um, we wanted to see how land surface was impacting tropical cyclones, so we thought, okay, let's put in land over um, land within the uh, ideal model, and uh, um, land within the ideal model. So we came up with this uh, configuration where the vortex was in the center of the domain, and then we moved the land surface underneath to, so as to realize uh, a landfall. Uh, at any point in time, depending upon when you want the landfall, so we could uh, change, we could change the speed with which a landfall was realized, and we could change the way uh, the land itself was represented, what kind of land you want, and we, to you, uh, to to test the hypotheses that we already had, we initialized the model to uh, sandy desert conditions, and uh, using uh, sea mass. Because we were moving land, we had to update the land constantly. And using C mask as one of the con as the control variable, we kept on uh, updating the land surface. Um, so uh, we wanted to, so using this idealized model, we wanted to test a couple of hypotheses. One is that high soil temperature, highly diffusive soil, uh, can re-intensify cyclones, and this is probably the uh, biggest necessary condition that needs to be uh, satisfied for a cyclone to re-intensify or sustain over land. Uh, the second one was that uh, warm and wet soil is more conducive to um, tropical cyclone intensification over land as opposed to just uh, warm soil alone. So it can synergistically act uh, to intensify a storm to a much day, late, much larger degree than just warm or wet soil. Um, so a control study was performed. Um, we wanted to make sure that the ideal uh, HWF was working right. So we wanted to we wanted to make sure that it was decaying as it would as it would uh, in normal circumstances. So we let soil temperature evolve. Uh, uh, over the course of the day or over the course of five days when uh, when we were running the model. And uh, we noticed that it was performing like it should. And uh, we could proceed on to try different experiments to understand how land surface was impacting tropical cyclones. So the first set of experiments was to, uh, was to test the sensitivity of surface temperature and uh, we uh, here in these experiments, we held the surface at a constant temperature, and we increase that temperature for different experiments from 300 to 314 Kelvin, which is which is actually burning the surface. Um, and we notice as the temperature of the land surface was higher and higher, uh, the intensity of the storm also increased. Um, and uh, like how we see, like how we would expect. Um, ocean temperature to be higher than the threshold, we also saw that there is a, a, a dependency on the soil temperature, or the higher the soil temperature, the greater is the ability for the cyclone to intensify. Uh, and we also looked at precipitation. Uh, when we increase the soil temperature, the precipitation was also increasing, um, simply because uh, the soil is the soil. The soil surface is primed uh, to rapidly transfer uh, evaporative fluxes 
that were from the cyclone itself. So it was basically recycling all the rainfall from the tropical cyclone, evaporating it really quickly, and then sending it back into the system. So, uh, so there's, there's the recycling of precipitation that was happening at higher temperatures and with diffusive soil. And this was not happening with other kinds of land surface, but only with sandy soil. Uh, it wasn't happening with clay or it wasn't happening with um, not so diffusive, clumped up together, not that sort of a uh, soil surface. Uh, since we were looking at uh, um, how tropical cyclones were, uh, uh, were reacting to land surface, we also looked at soil moisture and how is soil moisture um, modulating the intensity of the storm. And we noticed as we increase the soil moisture, um, we are also increasing the latent heat fluxes, the so soil moisture fluxes from the, uh, from, the, from the soil layer, which is also helping the storm to uh, re-intensify. Uh, but remember, this is already, the, the land surface is already at a higher temperature of 308. Uh, so that's about 30, 32 degrees Celsius, so it's pretty hot there. Uh, the third most uh, interesting variable was roughness length impact on TCs. Uh, Montgomery, in, uh, Montgomery from uh, NRL, uh, he studied uh, the impact on drag coefficient, impact of drag coefficients on how tropical cyclones um, evolve over ocean. And he found out that surface roughness has a, a, a dual role to play, uh, a non-linear dual role to play in how soil, uh, how TCs evolve. Uh, one is that as, as uh, Z0 increases, uh, you are also disturbing the primary circulation within the cyclone. Um, you're, you're increasing a lot more friction, so it's going to disturb the organized structure, or structure of the TC. Uh, but then as which which would event which would actually bring down the intensity of the storm, but increase in surface roughness is also going to increase the secondary circulation. It's also going to increase the inflow into the hurricane boundary layer, which is going to pull in a lot more moisture that is going to um, help the so storm to intensify um, or help the storm uh, pull in more moisture and energy into the system. So uh, we wanted to test how surface roughness works on land surface. And one of the important points that uh, we thought was one of the reasons why tropical cyclones um, uh, decay over land is because of the increased roughness. But what happens if it is going to pass through a, a region that is uh, so flat and, and like like a desert, which does not have a lot of vegetation, which does not bring in a lot of friction. So what happens then? So we tried that out, and uh, uh, the model is right now tuned to not differentiate between uh, thermal roughness and momentum roughness. So uh, we we didn't see any good results here. But then it's probably one area where. Uh, we would like to test more. We would like to understand how thermal roughness and momentum roughness uh, impacts uh, the circulation. But uh, in these experiments, as we increase the surface roughness, um, we were also um, not able to intensify the storm. The storm decayed pretty quickly after we increase uh, the uh, roughness. But um, like it was observed uh, with Montgomery and a lot of other uh, sea blast um, sea blast experiments, um, there was an increase in um, inflow. So there was an increase in velocity in the inflow region, which is pretty, uh, which is, which is pretty telling, and and it also it also makes you wonder. Okay, what happens when you separate the thermal comp uh, the roughness components into thermal and momentum? Um, so we kind of had a good idea about where um, how soil temperature and soil moisture affect tropical cyclones, but we wanted to understand the relationship and the interaction between these two terms. So uh, we performed a factor separation analysis that was outlined by Steen and Alpert in 1993, um, so as to isolate the impact alone. Uh, so, uh, so what was the contribution of soil temperature and soil moisture interaction alone? What was the contribution of soil temperature interaction alone? Uh, so we performed a series of eight experiments. 
um, we increase the soil temperature. Uh, so one of the sensitivity experiments was to increase the soil temperature from 308 to 314. So we understood what is the... Uh, uh, so we basically uh, plotted out how that six degree difference in soil temperature impacts um, the, the cyclone intensity, how the soil moisture increase by 50% impact, uh, interacts with the cyclone, and how those two together impact cyclone. Um, so these are the plots. Um, the first thing being uh, the increase. Uh, so this, this is a half molar plot of evolution of uh, the intensity of the storm. And when there is a six degree increase, that is the difference from the six degree increase. So, uh, and then we did the same experiment with soil moisture increase by 50%, and we saw an increase, but not as much as the soil temperature uh, alone. And then we, we did both of these experiments together. So we increased the soil temperature and we increased the soil moisture, and then we found out what is the interaction between them. How does the interaction between soil moisture and soil temperature increases the intensity of the storm? And we found out that the, uh, the contribution was greater than the individual components alone. Um, and another, uh, another result which is very telling is that the impact of soil temperature is almost immediate. So uh, the cyclone sees the land and it's at a higher temperature, it immediately re it reacts to the higher soil temperature. Whereas for soil moisture, it, is, uh, it takes its time, it lets uh, it, uh, the, the, uh, the atmosphere and the system needs a little bit of time to evolve to, to take into account the increased soil moisture to see the increase in latent heat fluxes. Um, this is also quite uh, uh, in line with other climate experiments that they've done in the past where soil moisture is almost a long, long term process. It almost takes a week or two weeks for a system to realize or the system to alter, um, alter uh, uh, its, its, its um, system to alter how uh, based on the soil moisture increase or the decrease. Um, Whereas soil temperature is almost immediate, which which is quite, which is quite cool because even within even within a tropical system, which is, uh, w which we measure in a matter of weeks, or which we measure in a matter of hours, um, is also reacting the same way to um, the land surface. Um, so we had quite a bit of results, and we were we wanted to basically see whether. Uh, we can get the same results from a real case analysis. Um, so far in the past, uh, uh, they, they have a, a bunch of studies for TSRN, and uh, they have always attributed the uh, increase in intensity or the re-intensification of um, ERIN to um, anomalous soil moisture over the Oklahoma and the Texas region. Uh, but we wanted to test out what is the impact of soil temperature. So we did the same factor separation analyses um, for uh, improving uh, by increasing the temperature and by increasing the soil moisture. We used FNL reanalysis data, which is coarse. So um, we didn't get that great a, a, a track result. Uh, but we also used NOAA LSM. Um, because we wanted to make sure that we could uh, simulate this with a much better land model. Uh, so this is what we observed. This is the MSLP and Vmax. And uh, the orange or the yellow line that you see there um, is with both of them combined, soil moisture and soil temperature combined. So even though it does not actually replicate the reintensification process of ERIN, it, it does show a much better impact uh, after soil temperature and soil moisture is increased. Uh, soil temperature obviously has a, a, a more pronounced effect than just increasing soil moisture. And uh, it, this also underlines how important it is to, um, how important it is to realistically represent the land surface to produce uh, good results uh, within a model to in, uh, to improve the intensity improve the uh, improve the intensity of a cyclone. Uh, so a summary of results is that 
higher soil temperature acts favorably to sustain a storm. Uh, number two is soil moisture and soil temperature uh, synergistically act together to improve uh, the intensification process over land. Um, the type of soil and soil properties is also very important when you consider um, the dynamics between uh, the land surface processes and the hurricanes or, or any weather uh, phenomena for that matter. And more importantly, ideal H work works. So it could be used as a tool um, to study more and more of uh, landfalling um, um, TC dynamics. And uh, it could almost be like a toy model where you can play around with it and you can modulate its uh, land surface characteristics. And there's so much applications that you could study. And uh, these are the few things I think uh, would be a really nice way um, to go forward. Um, one is already uh, one of my top priorities is to make ideal H work, work with NOAA LSN because right now it's with just with GFTL where temperature is only uh, only temperature is predicted, but I would like to make sure that soil moisture is also predicted. Right now in GFTL it is constant. Um, it's it's not close. It's not conserved. Um, hydrology is not conserved. Uh, the second one would be uh, to further test the impact of surface roughness on TC. Uh, a, a more detailed study is required to understand how surface roughness will, um, how surface roughness and the components of surface roughness will impact TCs. Um, the, uh, the other thing would be to understand the heterogeneity impact with uh, land cover change uh, being so pronounced right now. Um, and uh, you have these uh, boundaries that are being created because of increased heterogeneity in land surface, I think it would be a really cool study to find out how exactly tropical cyclones are affected by uh, heterogeneities. So you can put in heterogeneities within the model. You can see whether how, how when it crosses a boundary, how crop affects it. And on this side, if you have an urban area, so if it go somewhere in the middle, how does it get affected? How are the circular engines different? So that would be a really cool thing. And we're already doing the offshore impact of uh, land surface on TC, um, and we've got some really good results as well. Um, that's it. And uh, I thank Brunal. Uh, Brunal was awesome. Uh, I could always just go and bother him all the time. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, this doesn't work. Hey, can you help me? I'm like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and Laurie, uh, she's awesome too. Uh, Louisa and Mary Beth, I think they got done with my approvals and stuff within three days. I could, I mean, I, I found an apartment in three days and they're like, okay, come on, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll sort out everything. My, my acceptance of my offer letter was actually issued about a week after I came here. So it was really cool. <laughs> And it's amazing, amazing how efficient you guys are. Seriously. Uh, so it's awesome. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed it um, being here. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Happy to answer. Thank you. Questions? I'm curious, uh, in your Aaron experiment, you used the NOAA LSM. Yeah. Uh, what is the effect of precipitation on the soil temperature? Did you allow the soil temperature to evolve? Yes, we uh, did. Uh, one of the things that we found out was that uh, when and how you initialize the model is very important, uh, and uh, relative to when the cyclone was actually making landfall. Uh, so this particular experiment was initialized uh, late in the afternoon, early evening. Uh, but we, when we initialized the model to be around about close to uh, late evening, um, we didn't have that much of a pronounced effect on soil temperature. But yes, there was surface uh, cooling because of precipitation, and all of those were taken into consideration. But still, uh, the increased surface temperature was contributing to increase in um, uh, 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 increasing intensity of tropical cyclones over land. I have a, another question. Um, if you 
um, if the storm is moving faster r rather than slower, would you see a different effect, do you think? Yes. Uh, uh, the other thing that we noticed was how fast uh, the storm was moving over land. Uh, in these experiments, we were moving the storm over land. It, it was almost, you know, it was, it was, it was almost rushing the storm over land. So the shear effects were less pronounced, but the vertical structure of the storm was very shallow. So it was all. Uh, so the top layer of the storm was almost uh, taken apart, and it was it was a very sh shallow storm. But uh, I believe when when you move the land slower, when when you uh, realize landfall, uh, or when you move the storm much slower, then your shear effects, your frictional effects, are going to be much more pronounced. Yeah. It seemed in that uh, Hofmuller diagram that you showed that there was an impact in the storm size also. Uh, towards later in the forecast, there seemed to be a dipole, and uh, the higher 10-meter winds seemed to be further on the periphery of the storm. Have you seen that in other cases? Like, do you know if that's a systematic? Uh, I, I, I really haven't looked at it, but I have a, a theory uh, when when... Uh, tropical cyclones move over land. Uh, there is going to be a decrease in soil. Uh, there's going to be a decrease in moisture fluxes. I think it's more of an angular momentum conservation where the storm stretches out so that it can bring in more energy into the storm. So the swath of the storm is much bigger uh, than when compared to over the ocean, where uh, the localized evaporative heating um, uh, is is enough to sustain the storm. But whereas over over land, it needs to bring in a lot more energy into the storm. So I think, so that's what I think is happening. It just spreads out um, to bring in a lot more enthalpy fluxes into the system. But I haven't really looked at uh, observations. No, uh, it it would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of time. I'm, I'm supposed to be here until 3.30, so. <laughs> uh, this is kind of specul speculation. So um, given you know, your knowledge of uh, how the Hurricane Wharf is set up today, right? It uses the NOAA LSM, which is init initialized from the parent global model. Mm -hmm. Would you venture to comment on, like, what's the level of complexity that we would need to make better forecasts or, like, how much... How much effort do we need to put into defining well our, you know, initial land state and our LSM as compared to other things that are needed to make good tropical cyclone forecasting? Uh, so, uh, being an operational model, it's heavily tuned. Um, one of the experiments that we did was to compare how uh, slab LSM and how NOAA LSM compare with each other. And right now, there's not much of a difference. There's not much of an impact uh, on how the LSM uh, selection impacts your track or your intensity. Uh, the model is so highly tuned that it ignores the sensitivity of land surface. Uh, that being said, we have noticed uh, changes in how precipitation is modeled uh, with NOAA LSM compared to uh, slab. and. Uh, uh, Land surface modeling itself is not uh, is not a very uh, it's not a very easy task to achieve because you're talking about soil temperature and soil uh, soil moisture, which it is almost an abstract quantity and it's almost so difficult to um, get proper observations and 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 the observations might be close to reality or not at all, and you don't know how. Uh, we haven't understood the entirety of land surface physics at all. But of course it helps when you uh, improve soil moisture initialization because that is also very important when you take into consideration flood modeling because uh, your initial soil moisture is very important to, uh, to uh, basically model what is the runoff from the surface what is, uh, and how stream flow is modeled and how much precipitation, so it's all connected. Um, I guess it's, it's huge. I think, I think that's where people are headed towards, uh, because as you see, 
uh, more and more land surface changes happening and we've pretty much got down to uh, getting the track and intensity forecast almost close to observations. I think that's where the next um, uh, next effort in, in modeling is going to be headed. I think land surface would probably be one of the top there. At least that's what I think so. <laughs> this may be a dumb question. Um, is there a, a diurnal cycle, like for the, the radiation affecting the, okay, so. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, it does. Uh, even, even for a cyclone over the ocean, there is going to be a diurnal effect. There's going to be an expansion of um, uh, there's going to be an eye wall, uh, not I wouldn't say eye wall replacement cycle, but there's going to be an intensity increase and decrease, and that's even more pronounced over land because the temperature, uh, the surface temperature is going to also going to be diurnally varying. Um, it's it's a large variation between day and night for temp uh, for land surface temperatures. So yes, definitely, but uh, but yeah, e even with that, the memory of the land to uh, to affect the cyclone because of increased soil temperature and soil moisture is pretty awesome, I think. Was the increase applied uh, all across all 24 hours? Like it was always six degrees more than it was always 300? Or uh, so for the real case experiments, we just initialized with a plus degree difference. So plus six degrees difference. And then we let the land surface evolve on its own. Okay. Uh, for ideal cases, we held the surface temperatures constant because we just wanted to see how the higher surface temperatures contributed to intensity changes. They are not real case scenarios because you're never going to have surface temperatures being constant for five days. That's that's not going to happen at all. So. Okay, so in the idealized ones, there was no diurnal cycle. Of no, there was no diurnal the cycle. Okay. Uh, the radiation was still present, but then there was no diurnal cycle. Uh, but, th uh, but those experiments was just to understand how the surface temperature contributed to enthalpy uh, into the system. But that's it. And then we wanted to test out the hypotheses that we tested out in ideal case in the real case. And we, pr we got pretty good results. Any more questions? What would it take to get the idealized working with the NOAA LSM? Uh, <laughs> a good block of time, I suppose. <laughs> I was just talking to uh, uh, Louisa this afternoon. And I just, just said, uh, I have about two months to uh, defend. So once, and I have about a year to complete this project. So the next on my priority is that. It shouldn't take a long time. I just have to take apart NOAA LSM and work with the rest of the uh, rest of the variables there. Uh, GFDL is pretty simple because it doesn't. It's explicit temperature prediction, uh, so it doesn't have a lot of things to predict. Doesn't have a lot of things to uh, uh, to fall back on in terms of uh, parameters. Whereas NOAA LSM is a lot more complex than GFDL. Uh, so yeah, uh, just a good good chunk of time, I suppose. <laughs> Any more? I think we have many questions. I have a speculative question. Uh, I think you s saw everything with the intensity. Did you see any changes with track? I know it's a large scale, mostly large scale thing, but with changes in soil characteristics or you know. So did you see any changes in uh -huh. track forecasts? Well, with idealized, this, no. we, we yeah. can't really think cases. about track. But with, uh, mm, uh, oh. no, not really. Uh, not really. No, I, I, I haven't really tested out track yeah. yet. But I believe they might be if you can improve representation because you would be creating highs or low, local highs or low, and tropical cyclones, uh, though they're just massive systems that might not really uh, be affected by the small highs and lows, local highs or lows. Uh, 
I think there might be a very small yeah. uh, uh, impact. But definitely rainfall, uh, because you have convergent zones uh, with heterogeneities forming, rainfall and uh, all those might be affected. Winds, rainfall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And let's give another round of applause. And thanks for coming.